Good afternoon and welcome to the 92nd of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today I talk about choreography, dance, creativity, and the pandemic with David Brick and Ishmael Houston Jones. You can catch COVID Calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics, and please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, July 28, 2020, there are 16,540,137 confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. That's up from 16 million. 330,977 cases reported yesterday. Of those, 4,309,230 are in the United States. That's up from 4,262,674 reported yesterday. There are now a total of 148,298 deaths from COVID-19 reported in the United States. That's up from 147,143 yesterday, still at the over 1,000 daily deaths mark at this time. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for COVID-19 sufferers every day, and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is Fernando Mitef, 60, graffiti artist with a generous spirit dies. This appeared in the New York Times. This is by David Gonzalez and appeared on April 17th. Fernando Mitef liked his art so much he gave it away. Using the graffiti tag Nick 707, he was known for giving scraps of paper adorned with his graceful letter designs and outlines to up and coming artists to guide them and to fans to thank them. And for the last decade, he did something most strap hangers thought had vanished in the late 1980s. He brought graffiti back to the New York City subway. But this time he did it by boarding a train, replacing ads with pieces by some of the country's best known and most influential graffiti artists like Taki183 and switching them back at the end of his ride. I wanted to bring a new ideology to graffiti, he said in a 2015 interview about his guerrilla subway car exhibits, which he called Instafame Phantom Art. I didn't want to leave a mark that stays. I wanted to leave an impression. As long as you saw it and remembered it, I'm happy with that. Mr. Mitef died on April 12th at his home in the Bronx. He was 60. The cause was complications of COVID-19, said his younger brother, Karim, who managed his archives and was writing a book about Mr. Mitef's graffiti career. In a culture known for egos and arguments, Mr. Mitef prided himself on sharing his love of the art. He was always giving, giving, and giving, Kareem Mitef recalled of his brother's early years. He'd sit at McDonald's doodling on napkins and pass it out. He would be more apt to give away his work than to sell it. Mr. Mitef was born in Buenos Aires to Diana and Alexis Pablo Mitef, a professional boxer who once fought Muhammad Ali and worked as a television production manager after retiring. His parents had been spending a year in Argentina before returning to New York. Kareem said his brother was raised in the Morsenia section of the Bronx, where he started tagging at 12 after discovering a can of spray paint in his home's basement. He later founded the Out to Bomb crew, a loose-knit group of collaborators and influenced younger artists like Serve and his protege NOC167, who went on to fame. Though he spent much of his adult life working odd jobs, including chauffeur and stand-up comic, he returned to the subways in 2009 after he and a friend had a brainstorm. It led to his Instafame project. His easy personality and sense of humor helped him persuade collaborators from established to up and coming ones, even to paint pieces on the sidewalk outside art openings. He was a funny dude, but he took a lot of people under his wing, said Eric Fellisbred, author of Graffiti New York, a survey of the city's graffiti history. He was completely into graffiti for the love of it. All those panels he did, he could have only written 
Nick, and that would put him in the spotlight. Instead, he put his love for the art in the spotlight. I'd like to turn to our discussion for today. And starting out, I want to introduce my guests. David Brick co-founded Philadelphia's Headlong Dance Theater with Amy Smith and Andrew Simonet in 1993. Over the next two decades, these three co-founders created over 40 dances as Headlong, performing nationally and internationally. In 2008, David co-founded the Headlong Performance Institute, a training program for creating experimental performance. David collaborates broadly in creating performance, participatory events, and community. His experience of growing up as a hearing member of a deaf family continually influences David's understanding of human bodies as active manifestations of culture. His recent work includes a residency at Dance Place in Washington, D.C. to work on Island of Signs, a performance that explored growing up in a family with two languages, one that was shared and one that was not. He shared that residence with Carolyn Brick, his 78-year-old deaf mother who attended nearby Gallaudet University and was featured in a 1959 documentary about her experience there. My second guest is Ishmael Houston Jones. He's a choreographer, author, performer, teacher, and curator. His improvised dance and text work has been performed worldwide. He's received three New York Dance and Performance Bessie Awards for collaborations with writer Dennis Cooper, choreographers Miguel Gutierrez, and Fred Holland and composers Chris Cochran and Nick Hallett. Houston Jones curated Platform 2012, parallels which concentrated on choreographers from the American, from the African diaspora and postmodernism, and co-curated with Will Rawls Platform 2016, Lost and Found, Dance, New York, HIV AIDS, Then and Now. As an author, Houston Jones's essays, fiction interviews, and performance texts have been published in several anthologies. His first book, Fat and Other Stories, was published in June 2018 by Yonkers International Press. Ishmael and David, thank you so much for making time to come on COVID Calls today. Thanks for inviting us. It's nice to be here. I'd like to remind people you can get your questions in, just put them into the YouTube live chat, or you can put them up on Twitter and just be sure to tag at US of Disaster, or you can email them to me in the call. Some people like to do that. My email address, sgk23 at drexel.edu. So I'd like to start um, the way I've been starting all the calls by finding out where you're calling in from and what the COVID-19 situation looks like there today. Ishmael, could I start with you? Sure. Um, I live, I am where I live in the East Village of Manhattan in New York. Um, I don't know statistics. I, I haven't been following statistics um, but I have been, just anecdotally, what we hear is that New York has like, <clears throat> cases have gone down, deaths have gone down. People are relaxing, which makes me a little bit nervous. Um, relaxing, especially here in the East Village, there are a lot of bars and restaurants that are open for outside service. So it's sort of changed sort of the landscape of the neighborhood actually, because suddenly it's very almost European, sort of like the Ramlas in Barcelona. There are all these outdoor places where people are congregating and eating. Weird because servers are still masked, but people eating obviously are not. I've only gone to one restaurant in the last five months. Um, that was this weekend with a friend of mine, Yvonne Meyer. Um, so it sort of has this sort of weird feeling where things are coming back in this sort of like groovy kind of way. And I, hmm. I worry that that is going to presage another outbreak, another major outbreak, actually. I can totally relate to that, that feeling. Uh, after we've taken on board the idea that people shouldn't be doing a certain thing and then to see it again, it is this sort of, uh, I don't know what the word for that is, just a disorientation of, of yeah. sorts. I just sort of meant Ishmael, let me stay with you. Yeah. yeah, just Go sort ahead. of walking around, I've just sort of been clocking like the mask wearing, whereas I say a month ago, it was about at 80% of people in the street, and it's sort of gone down, sort of, not quickly, but like now I'd say it's about at 65, 70% of people walking around without, or mm -hmm. with, actually. What's the um, protest situation there in New York right now? 
still things happening in the streets, signs up, people taking actions, or has that mostly now? Signs are up. It's not as intense as it was there. I was volunteering at Performance Space 122 in their courtyard. I was make just for a couple of days, I was making sort of emergency kits for people. And then one day I was making sandwiches to go to protests. And I wound up accidentally winding up going to the protest, going on the march. I hadn't intended to. I mean, I'm over 60 and I've been really careful about being in large crowds, but it felt really good to do when I did it. But it seems like it's less intense now. I know there's been some activity around City Hall um, and also sort of encampments that have been broken apart and put back together and broken apart and put back together. So that mm -hmm. kind of, uh, of homeless, homeless people, but... I think the big... What was happening big, at PS1? Yeah. Oh, PS122, uh, Performance Space New York now. Um, in the courtyard, um, the actually, Performance Space 122 did this interesting thing art-wise this year before the, before the pandemic. Um, they had decided it was their 40th anniversary, and they decided to choose a cohort of artists to run the build to run their portion of the building, which means they did all the they do all the curating and all the you know everything and managing the building. And then when the pandemic hit New York, they were mostly young artists and they were very activists. So they began doing trainings. They sort of a lot of support around the protests. Like I said, I was making emergency kits with people. Um, mm -hmm and sandwiches and taking water and you know, yeah. that kind of thing. And That's also during the curfew, they were they convinced the building to be open for people to take refuge since they weren't allowed that people couldn't take subways because the subways were down. So it became a place where people could shelter at night. Oh, that's amazing. I hadn't seen any any reporting or writing about that. I hope somebody sort of collected that that story is like a tremendous story to be told there. And there were problems also with the, you know, also city politics within the building, because there are five different organizations in the building and some were less welcoming than others, so. I imagine. Um, thank you, Ishmael. David, let me turn to you, same question. Where are you calling from? What's the pandemic situation there? So uh, I'm calling from Philadelphia uh the I, you know, I was thinking about the masks and the opening um more people are wearing masks than uh were before um i i live in a pretty um mixed neighborhood when it comes to um where people are on the po political divide I, I live in a neighborhood where a lot of people voted for obama and then voted for trump um, and so there was a, a, you know, for a long time, there was a, a pretty irritated view in my neighborhood um, about, for many people in my neighborhood, about wearing a mask at all. And then when Trump started wearing a mask and his numbers had begun to go up in, um, in you know, in various hot spots, suddenly everyone started wearing masks. So it, it, it's been interesting to see more people wear masks, but also more people are out on the streets and there's, you know, um, a lot more traffic and a lot more um, uh, uh, people roaming around. Um, I just, I just my, my sense of the data in Philadelphia, I'm sure you know better than I do, um, is uh, that uh, things aren't, dwindling down like cases are i think i think they're they're, hold, they're holding steady um not at a low mm -hmm. rate you know but not 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 peak not not spiking up either um uh on the most personal level i feel like um i have a nine-year-old daughter and so the politics uh of what do we do about um, her health and well-being in all kinds of ways? About going back to school, about participating in 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 other programs, in in parts of my community. That's that's a huge conversation and um, and really gut wrenching, really really difficult. Um, we've 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 been 
exploring bubbling with a couple of different family groups. And it's been, it's been hard. It's been challenging and, and hard and testing, um, uh, you know, as we kind of like seek ways to be healthy, you know, and have healthy human contact. And especially for, I, I shouldn't say especially, but also for, for my nine year old, you know, mm-hmm. to be with, to be able to run, jump and play and touch folks who aren't just her old parents, you know, it's like a, it seems like a big deal. Mm-hmm. Do you have a sense of what's happening with the with the schools next month? Has that decision been made in Philadelphia or no? I, I just got a text message, like literally just as we were starting, saying that um, it looks like that school suddenly is now going virtual until at least November. Um, and there's just been these agonizing conversations about hybrid attend you know hybrid programs and you know and suddenly today they're like we're not we're not putting it seemed that's what i somebody texted me that so mm-hmm. i don't know if that you know how that's true or not but um and philadelphia yeah. has been the center of uh so much of the george floyd you know the protests and and this particular incident in which the protesters were stranded on the expressway and had to scramble up the embankment. Some of the worst images I've seen have come out of Philadelphia and I find that horrifying. I don't know how much of that has touched you, David. Well, I thought um, our family did go to one protest. I have 80 year old parents that, um, uh, we try to be in socially distanced contact with, and uh, m- uh, my partner also has some immune issues. So we've been really, really careful about um, social distancing, but we did, interestingly, similar to you, uh, Ishmael, there's just a day where it felt like we, ha- it was actually my birthday, like we just couldn't stop ourselves from attending a protest and we got drawn in deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, I think, I think the kind of the big things going on in Philadelphia are really known. I thought it might be interesting to share a little bit about just in our very specific South Philly neighborhood. Um, so there's two parks, you know, Philadelphia is a city of parks and we have a couple of parks that are parks that we walk by or walk around or, um, participate in, um, uh, you know, the life of those parks. Um, and in one of them, the park has been under construction. So there's a fence going around the outside of it. And there was a, a, a neighborhood family protest, uh, a Black Lives Matter protest. And a lot of children had made signs and they were hung up on the, fe- on the fence. Um, and then, so there was this big, and there's a fire station and a police station that kind of ring the park. Um, and so a lot of defund the police was kind of mixed in with the Black Lives Matter. And then there was some like ripping down of the signs. And then there was like a city worker who was caught on video ripping down the sign and having an argument um, with a neighborhood person. And it turns out he was an officer in the family court, you know, and he was, you know, he was, he was, uh, uh, you know, so there was a, a thing about that and he, he ended up losing his job and then new signs started coming up on the, on the fences mm-hmm. around and a lot of them writ, written by children and then like kind of more philosophical, like quotes by, um, you know, James Baldwin. <laughs> it's been this like evolving wall and we walk around wow. that park like three, four times a day cause we have a dog <laughs> and, um, and then the other park is Marconi Park, with a uh, where a lot of protests were happening around the statue of Columbus. Um, and there was, a, I think, a Facebook like my neighbors started saying, "Antifa is out, so we have to get our guns and we have to protect our park." You know, we have to protect. And so there was an armed showing of of white people in uh, Marconi Park, you know, around the statue, and. And it was, you know, we would go by that park and there would be people with guns 
protecting the statue and um, uh, and then protests that would kind of come up around that. So I see, I've experienced a lot of this through the, through the eyes of my nine-year-old and, and it's daily, you know, it's day, the, I feel like the, the protests and the cultural conversation has been um, a part of our lives in a way that feels extremely meaningful as a kind of a daily conversation about what is happening um, in America and with race. Um, and, it, you know, it happens on our dog walks as we encounter the traces of protest. Thank you both for giving us that insight into what you've been, you know, going through and what it looks like where you are. And it's not surprising to me that you both describe in such detail. Um, artists, I think, often have a tendency to be very attentive to the world around them. And I want to, we've got a lot to talk about today, but Ishmael, I wanted to ask you first if we, you know, I read your your biography, which I know just skims the surface, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, what aspects of your career you find at this time most resonant or meaningful, like works you've made in the past or things you've learned in the past or people you've taught in the past that are coming to you in this moment in, in time, sort of thinking about your career well, my career, as you read, is very hyphenated. Um, I do a lot of different things. Um, what I've been doing mostly in the la last half year has been teaching. I mean, I have come to the point, come to the realization in my late in my life that teaching is a very important part of my art practice. That it is something that I do, and I do practice and strive to do it well. So, teaching was very sort of like the pandemic and the sheltering in place has thrown a real sort of bright light on like what teaching means to me also I, i'm writing and i mean you know i've been taking the opportunity to actually write so that's good i'm not working on any performance things right now there's one looming in the future but so so teaching and writing have been the main things i've been doing um the teaching, I think, was really interesting because the remote, as I teach, uh, the spring semester, I was teaching both at UArts in Philadelphia and at NYU here in New York, which means I was commuting one day a week, which was, I like being on Amtrak, you know, <laughs> especially when someone else is paying. Um, um, and all the classes I was teaching were basically variations of uh, composition classes, but Sort of when people talk about going back to normal, and this is sort of jumbled, but I'll try to make it make sense. There's a sense that maybe normal isn't what we want to go back to. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of like my art making career, I mean, I'm in sort of the alternative, experimental, in the dance world, which means I usually work on a piece for a year to have it be performed at most two weekends. So I would get eight performances that didn't actually support financially the actual creation process, hopefully get some touring out of it. So it's sort of like a normal that I'm not really, you know, that anxious to get back to. Um, in terms of teaching though, uh, what remote learning online teaching taught me is that or made me realize is that there's even at a school at like nyu which is very expensive and a certain demographic of people go there there's a huge disparity on access and privilege mm -hmm. like because suddenly you know we're looking at people's living rooms mm -hmm. and people have different levels of equipment some people have really incredible because it was a composition class so i would give assignments and people some people would come back with these incredible, you know, pieces and some people, you know, they were, you know, doing something in, you know, in a very wanky living room, you know, or bedroom even, which, right. And there are people, they were back at home. So there were siblings, younger siblings running around and pets. And it just sort of like, mm -hmm. and also just sort of the technology hasn't caught up. Um, the disparity is there, um, things break down, things fall apart. 
And also what I do is so much about tactile learning, teaching, hands-on, you know, really being present in a studio with people gathered together. Mm -hmm. And I just finished actually tomorrow's graduation of uh, four MFAs from UArts in Philly. Um, I was teaching there this summer and one thing I would give assignments and people would come back with videos and really well-made videos. And it was, I was wondering, has our art form shifted? Has, have we shifted? Are we, I mean, it was already there shifting away from live art, which has been like what I've been involved with you know, for the last 40 years. <laughs> like it, has there right. been a pull away of like what this art form means and how it's going to be, you know, consumed. Wow, that's there's so many things packed into what you were just saying. I mean, we've been talking about this in higher education. Generally, I haven't had the chance to speak with the choreographer about it yet. This question, I was talking with my history, you know, faculty colleagues, like, do our students need us to be in the room? We we have felt like there needed to be, you described it as a tactile connection. And even in the seminar room, there is that feeling of body language even right. discussing a text, and yet something does feel like there's been a, I don't think we'll get rid of classrooms or studios, but there does seem to be a, sh a shift and a move, and my students are certainly quite comfortable with doing a lot of work remotely. That doesn't seem to irritate them. Let me ask you, though, about the tactile part and being out of the studio. Um, I've spoken with scientists uh, in, in the last few weeks who describe, last few months, who describe that as a real loss, like being out of their lab. So yeah. How have you coped with that part of it? I've coped because I've had to. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I've missed it, and I, I, it was an important part of my imparting whatever knowledge I have. Is sort of like being hands-on, being face-to-face, -face, looking directly into someone's eyes, looking, you know, or, you know, working with eyes closed and like, you know, feeling the space, you know, all those things suddenly almost disappeared. I felt, tried to find ways in which I could incorporate those kinds of things into it. But people were basically alone, which, you know, in these boxes that we're looking at. And it um, it's different. And I was think I actually started looking at the sort of the history of the phonograph and how that changed how people perceived music. Like before you know, cylinders in the late 1800s, for me, people, you had to be present to hear music. You had to either make it yourself or be in your tribe to hear it or go to someplace right. to hear it live. And I would say like of the stuff that's on my now antiquated uh, iPod classic, I would say 99.9% .9 of the people I've never seen live I don't go to hear live music very often, but I'm a fan, you know, I follow these you know, musicians, these artists, but there was, you know, and I'm wondering, you know, if this field is also going to, to devolve or evolve mm -hmm. in a way in which sort of the live element is, you know, taken, you know, there was a time when you had to go someplace to hear live music, to hear music. <laughs> right. And now, <laughs> right. You, you know, put on some earbuds and you, you have it right there. And it also changed right. the art form. There are things that happen that can happen technically that could not happen live. And we've accepted those things as normal as so. Mm. So I'm not, I'm not hopeless. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, for yeah. me, I feel like the, the deep, you know, the deep wisdom of performance is, for me, it's so connected to the element of liveness um, that uh, I, I've, my, you know, my question is like, well, if dance as an art form becomes something that's not about liveness, so then where is it that people are getting the experience of uh, exchange and what I would call like um, reciprocal animation is my funny, you know, to awkward a term for it, but how are we transformed by one another? How are, you know, uh, technologies of empathy, you know, uh, played out, you know, uh, if, if not in the art form of dance, then, then where? And I think it could shift to other places that people 
engage with each other. But because I'm a choreographer and I, I feel like this is this is my work is to find the liveness. I, I've been really so I think you know performance. The the very fundamental aspect of performance is um, witnessing and testifying. Like there's like uh, it, it's an exchange of witnessing and testifying, and that empathy is part of that. Like in in seeing another, I am changed by them, or the possibility of being changed by them. Um, uh, uh, so I, those are my my questions about this. You know, Zoom. I've been a lot of things happening on Zoom, and this question of like what is what is lost and what is gained. Right, and I, I hosted a showing um, that was a Miami-based showing, but I was able to host, you know, because everything was online. Um, and I I offered the the artist the the choice of showing video, um, you know, that they had worked on, and then getting feedback about it. And the Zoom format actually was an amazing live way to do feedback because people would talk and chat in the box at the same time. So a real like robust exchange of information could happen that doesn't happen in a studio, you know, studio showing. But um, some people would show video and some people would perform live on their camera, you know, and I was really struck by the differences between those things, the, the, the liveness of performing you know, even on the camera mm. had for me just definitely is more like, you know, felt more poignant, more relevant, more, um, uh, you know, like a different experience than when somebody's showing a video. It's like now I'm in the realm of just channeling through things on my computer and looking at video of things. So that was um, that I still think there's an element. The other thing I'll say about the Zoom space um, is or the video space, is that instead of us gathering together in a shared space, we're gathering from our private spaces, not always private, but often private and personal spaces. And I feel like there's a way that that's meaningful, like in terms of relating to empathy, mm -hmm. being able to peer into your world and think about that and feel that and feel your context is something I don't get in a, you know, when we gather at the theater, you know, or gather at a, a park or something to see a performance. Um, I'm seeing more of you in some sense, and I've been working with ways to underline that. So like at the beginning of a, of a, uh, I, I've been hosting a weekly kind of con contemplation and making um, kind of a Quaker meeting slash art <laughs> making um, thing online every weekend. And we mm. start with uh, what's called testify your space. And you can just make a gesture or s describe your space, or you can move your camera around your space or do anything that actually helps, um, you know, that is like trying to connect others to the space that you're in. Just like your urge at the top of the show, tell us where you're, you know, where you're coming from, you know? So kind of, kind of trying to make a deeper virtue of that. Hmm. I noticed this also, this sort of this quick aside, um, in sort of my sort of like religious practice that I go to a very uh, robust and politically active church and I go weekly Sundays. And since we've been remote, it's really interesting. Like it's sort of like, sort of like the shaking hands and hugging is like gone. But there's also something interesting about the chat that people are engaged the entire time during this religious, mm. like, People are saying things and giving affirmations and giving comments. And I was wondering when we go back, you know, we, everyone talks about when we're back in the building, like, you know, what it will be like. And I said, yeah, it could be a little bit weird, you know, it could be weird not to be, to be sitting all facing one way, you know, but yeah. It's, I thought about that too, the, the chat. I, I have found that to be really interesting, and some people have used it in a kind of a transgressive a little bit. It's like the passing notes, you know, that you used to do in, in school. There was the back channel was happening. Um, and then I've been in meetings where we're doing the Zoom meeting, and then there's a very lively ongoing text communication on the side also. People are having these different channels open. 
simultaneously. Um, I, one thing that both of you, you know, kind of came up in different ways, but in your discussion, to me, I, would, I call it kind of vulnerability, but I think it's resonant with the different words you were both using, that when you're teaching in person or performing in person, there is a vulnerability of the artist or the teacher in the sense that they're, you're in it. You could always just say class is over, or the performance has ended, I'm leaving. <clears throat> but that's not usually how it works. It's usually like you've opened yourself up and made yourself vulnerable in a space in a particular place and time. I, I wonder if, if you think we can achieve that in this, in this format, in these remote formats, that, that kind of vulnerability that makes art so compelling, particularly live art. Oh, we could try. <laughs> David, you want to do something? Yeah, let's let's try. Let's try. Ishmael and I uh, yeah. can can make a, a stab at it right now. Okay, how long do you I want to go? I was hoping for? you would say that. <laughs> <laughs> so set us up a little bit. What's coming, and if you can, and I will um, I will absent myself while you while you do that, and I'll come back when you're when you're ready. While the dance is beginning. What are you seeing, David? I see uh, my room. Uh, it's my office slash guest room and the row house that I live in, in South Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, in the United States, in North America, and so on. I see a mess, uh, a room that hasn't been cleaned in months, stacks of papers and books and bags uh, overflowing. What do you see, Ishmael? I'm, actually, I see my computer screen, which is I see you through the screen. I see your name. I see that I've only used my first name when I typed my name in, I see my face. I keep thinking I'm looking in the wrong place as I'm looking down. I see three works of art behind me in my apartment. And I refer to this as my well curated Zoom <laughs> room. Uh, there's a drawing and a painting by Daryl Mackey, who was a Philadelphia artist who died, I think, in the early 2000s, who had been a roommate of mine when I lived in Philadelphia. And there are two silk screens by David Wanarovich, who, also, who died of AIDS, I think, in the 90s, um, who was also a friend, but not a close friend. Uh, I see my blue beard is fading, and I need to touch it up. Um, yeah. So what are you touching? I'm touching my knees. My hands are both spread on my knees. And uh, I feel my back touching the cushion of the, of the couch that I'm sitting on. Um, I'm starting to push my knees down, and I'm actually pushing my legs out in front of me. And I'm starting to stand up uh, in my messy disaster of a room. I'm starting to stand up and feel my weight rocking back and forth from foot to foot. What are you feeling, Ishmael? I'm feeling an expansion. I feel like I'm going out into the air, that my body is being sort of merging with the air around me. I feel the air from the air conditioner on my left side, a ceiling fan above me, another fan to the right of me. And there's this sort of convection of air all around me. And I feel like I'm sort of swirling in it. I'm sort of becoming the swirl of air 
that's also me and I am the air and the air is me and I am the air and the air is me and I am the air and the air is me. Seeing that swirl of you in the air happening makes me want to slice through the air and so I'm jumping up and down and my body has become very thin, like a almost like a five foot eight razor or wedge that's slicing up and down through the air and then slicing side to side through the air and beginning to, to bounce from wall to wall. And sometimes I get a little stuck in a wall and I have to like pull myself out of the wall and then I slice into another wall. And as I do that, the room is being cut up and the rubble that is already here is beginning to get deeper and deeper. My swirling has become a tornado, a cyclone whirling around the room that I have become this tornado. I have become the cyclone. I have become the swirler of all the objects. So everything I own in this space is just becoming one blur of object, of thing, of thingness. I am becoming the thingness of everything else and everything else has become the thingness of me. Somehow I'm able to reach into your space. Um, and as my arm reaches into your, your swirl, something lands in my hand, but I can't see what it is. I wonder if you can see what my hand has landed in my hand. I think it's a heart-shaped rock. I think it's a heart-shaped rock found on a beach in, in, the, in Montauk. I pull that rock back into my room and I put it next to a heart-shaped rock that is on my altar that is a mess, but still an altar, still recognizably an altar. And I put those two rocks side by side and I begin to um, float through the wall of this row house and I'm floating northeast towards New York. The cyclone has calmed down. Things are settled on the ground. Things are in disarray, but in a sort of peaceful, lovely disarray. I'm happy that my rock has found your rock. As I float towards you, um, I, I feel impatient. I feel um, that even though I'm light like air, it feels hard to, to get where I'm going as fast as I want to be. I want to be there now, just like I was reached into your room. I want to actually be in your space, but I'm just air and it's slow moving. I think you can make it. I think if you really, really try, I think you can really make it to here. I see you. I'm, I'm looking into your window and I, I, I suddenly feel um, that I can't enter your space. Um, and I feel lonely. I feel sad. Um, and I, can't and leave. I can't leave because I only leave at 7 o'clock p.m. It's the only time I ever leave my apartment. So we're stuck on either side of the glass of the window. It's lonely, but it's okay. My body is heavy and fear until I start to rain. And now I'm on drops of water on your window. Drops of water are lovely. And the dance ends. And the dance ends. <laughs> So what was that like? That was our attempt at a, a you know, a performance, a, a dance performance, a, a choreography in this medium. Scott, how was well, it? You were the... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel so privileged. I mean, there are many people watching. Um, I'm privileged to be able to speak to you immediately after and others uh, are welcome to um, to weigh in and may, may wish to do so, you can do that in the YouTube live chat. And I just want to um, remind people that you're listening to COVID calls and you've just uh, seen and listened to 
a talking dance performed by Ishmael Houston Jones and David Brick. And oh, you know, I should say that it's a uh, that that structure is the genesis of that structure is a, a headlong dance um, created by myself <clears throat> with uh, Andrew Simonette and Amy Smith called the Impossible Dance. It's a, originally performed as a talking dance where we sit on a stage and imagine a dance without doing it. Mm -hmm. I impressed how quickly you um, you connected with each other and and how the movements that you were describing began to connect. And the thing I that I really loved about it, at the moment at which my head started to tingle really was when uh, um, when it became clear that the, that neither of you could carry on with what you were doing without the other. Mm. That there was this there was this touch point in the narrative in which you both became part of the other's story. And I've had the benefit um, because of my my wife and, and her introducing me to modern dance. I've had the benefit of seeing a lot of dance and and uh, and I always loved that moment in the performance where you're like, oh, you got that ex feeling of that that connection, even through abstract movements and somehow it re and it reaches different people at different moments. Um, that was, Im that was impressive that you could. I felt very, felt very connected. Achieve that. Like, I mean, I felt very connected to David's story and, and I felt that moment too, when they became, when they actually intertwined, I thought it was really, one thing that I didn't say earlier <laughs> going back about things that are happening in East village is that sort of based on, the sort of thing that was happening in Italy, people coming out on their balconies and cheering at a certain hour. I live in a co-op building in the East Village. And um, so at seven o'clock, which I referenced in the dance, uh, we've been going up to the roof and we just stopped it last week because it's just really hot at seven o'clock on the roof. But there's a, one of my neighbors in the co-op is a bagpipe player. So he would go up and play bagpipes I had some bells that I would ring. Another person was just banging on her cookware. And, but it was also happening on other rooftops all over the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And this for five minutes mm -hmm. every day, it was just like this incredibly mm -hmm. cathartic thing of people, some people just cheering and clapping. Mm -hmm. And then as sort of the sort of feeling of emergency sort of has lessened in New York, fewer and pu fewer people were doing it. And also it's getting hot. <laughs> But it was just like this ritual that went on for a couple of months where at you know seven o'clock there was this cheering and loud playing and especially the bag the bagpipes when we stopped people would like ask me is that bagpipe what happened to the bagpipes you know it's like the john's bagpipes <laughs> became really really famous like it was written in one of the papers that there was this mysterious bagpipe player on east 13th street and, mm. Mm. but that was really it was very key it Did was like this other ritual that i went to every, you know, every day it was like this daily ritual at seven o'clock. That's what we did. That, um, I want to ask you a little bit more about it. Cause I, you know, Ishmael would send pictures once in a while. And when, when I did talk to Ishmael over the last few months, he would always mention the seven, the seven o'clock celebration, protest, communion, and I wonder if you'd just say a little bit more about it, because it feels like there was this spontaneous, like this ritual of being present on the rooftop. And at different times, it, because it existed as an iteration, as a, as a ritual, that at different times, I got the impression that at different times it was, you know, cathartic and celebratory. At different times, it was a protest. At different times, it was, um, you know, a shout out to the emergency workers. Um, so, and to me, that's one of the things coming out of this time. It's like, I want art to be more like that. I want art to be iterative rather than the one-off where you, you perform the eight shows after you've been working on something for a year or two years, that it's actually, it's always happening. You know, there's work that the rooftop, the seven o'clock is always happening and the art becomes a container to hold different things. So, 
I really captured my imagination. Ishmael, I just would love to hear you talk a little bit more about some of the, like what, what, cause I feel like I have a fantasy of it, but I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about some of the things that happened at seven o'clock over the arc of the last five months. Well, it started as a shout out to the essential workers. I mean, that was sort of like the sort of reason that sort of led us to do it. And then it began growing, right? People literally on, on rooftops in all four directions were playing. There's this incredible woman who I can't remember the name of it. She's in two bands and she would come out. Her apartment's on 12th Street, but her fire escape faces our place and she's a drummer. So she'd bring her snare drum out and start drumming wildly. There was some person who we've only who lived on the first floor of one of the buildings that faces ours, and we could only see that person's hands, but they were always ringing these sort of like bells, these sort of like really sort of incredible bells, and it was just like, and sometimes it was a celebration, and sometimes it was like really protest during the when there were uh, curfews, we were really protesting the curfews. Um, my friend Carolyn lives across 13th Street from me, and we like shout at each other you know, <clears throat> news and things that are happening. So yeah, it was iterative and it was, um, and it did change. And I, I feel sort of the, the loss that I actually went up last night because the bell ringer, the mysterious bell ringer, who's only, we've only seen the person's hands is still doing it. And I felt really yeah. bad. So I went up on the roof to ring my bells with them, even though I have no <laughs> idea who this person is, so. I wanted to just throw this in the in the mix because we also did a I did a um, COVID calls discussion with Marco Leonhardt, who's a taiko drum uh, instructor and performer, and he was doing that on his rooftop, Ishmael, while you were doing yours. Although he was up in in uh, Washington Heights, but um, I want you know just to follow up on that a, a little bit, you know, David, to what you were saying about about that ritual and that time for something that felt like ritual and not worrying about it being a performance, but just allowing it to be. I mean, there were certain parameters, right? There was a time and a location. Um, yeah. did, do you use, have you used practices like that before either or both of you in your choreography that you sort of say, okay, well, there's a time and a place and we're gonna come together there without too much uh, uh, too much pre-scripted, but we're gonna use that time and that place to make sense of something or to process something, but we're gonna do it through, yeah. in your well, case, maybe through, David, through movement. For the last year, last year, was actually very much like that, actually. Yeah, so um, Ishmael was you know, incredibly generous and advised me on a piece that was, a. Uh, 15 month uh, residency at the Washington Avenue Pier here in South Philadelphia. And basically every Saturday, well, every Friday was a rehearsal that anybody could come to um, that had a, 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 the structure of the performance. So we rehearsed by doing the performance, <laughs> you know, and then newcomers, we had like ways for newcomers to matriculate in. And then every Saturday was, a performances that were, um, there were three scores that would happen over the course of two hours and they were always evolving. And they, you know, it started as a ritual. And, and this is where I first, I, you know, doing that project actually really has transformed my intention around art making. Cause I, I think art is better when it's part of our, our daily practices, not just artists, but part of everyone's life and not just a date that you circle on the calendar and go to. Um, uh, and so these, these, these scores evolved according to the participation of people who showed up. Sometimes people showed up mm -hmm. over and over and over again and began to show up on rehearsal days and performance days. And sometimes people came back as audience members over and over and over again. And, um, and the scores were open ended uh, you know, and and grew according to the the participation of people over time, um, and it, for me, that's really a touchstone of this time. Is like, can you know, like when Ishmael, when you talk about like what's the better world, 
like instead of getting back to normal, like what's the better world? Like one of the the things I imagine is versions of performance and art practice that really are much more about the about the ongoing, almost ordinary participation, you know, uh, and that it's 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 it is like a drumming, you know, you know, the village is doing the art. You know, it's not it's not um, a rarefied thing that goes away, perfected and then like revealed, you know, to the community. But it's it's a, it's reciprocal with the community. So um, that's the you know that's the the role of art in the world that I imagine, you know, that I I you know I I, I would like us to go towards, you know, with this interruption of business as usual. Right. I think it's. Uh, I think I'm hopeful that we will go to something better than we had before. At least something different. And because what we had before wasn't exactly working for a lot of people in terms of art practice and art in general, art making. Can we come back to the students then, in that regard, and? And I guess I don't just mean the students who sign up to take a class. I mean, you've even just broadened my sense of who the student of David Brick is. I mean, it sounds like for the last year, there have been a lot of students who maybe they didn't realize till later they were a student of movement. Um, that seems to me one of the possibilities of this moment in many different domains um, is that people are participating in new communities, oftentimes because they, they have to, they're part of an online class or they're part of a support group or um, they're part of the walkers who are in the park every night at a set time or whatever it may be, there's these new configurations emerging. Right. I at the really same time, and that's, and that's hope. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was saying, I just felt really hopeful about that. And in terms of teaching, I just realized that, you know, in just just because of the nature of Zoom and online, that you know, I had students from, you know, New Zealand, India, Hong Kong, you know, who couldn't, you know, who I would never have had, who you know wouldn't have been able to come to New York, and that you know, I'm you know, I, it was really interesting having this one right from Burkina Faso in my class, you know, it's like you know, and that mm -hmm. would not have, that would not have happened ordinarily. <laughs> Mm -hmm. There's something I wanted to ask you both that's been on my mind and maybe you can help me think about it a little bit um, is about breathing. I, we did a COVID calls um, with some extraordinary researchers from a research group in the UK um, and they focus on breathing and the psychology of breathing and breathing distress and PTSD associated with distress and breathing like asthma or people who have COPD. So this connection between the physical and the psychological. Um, but I haven't talked with any artists about breathing and I know breath is central to, to any art, but particularly to choreography and to dance. And this era has been one in which the restriction of breath is something that we worry about. It's, it's what's, when we talk about intubation, you know, the real horror stories we hear are about the loss of breath. And I, I don't know if that resonates with either of you as you have thought about your work previously or in this time, what, it, what this discussion about breath can open. Can we process it somehow through movement or choreography and dance. I just realized that um, even before the pandemic that I started, I would start almost all of my movement classes, movement based classes with a period of meditation, which started with breathing, starting breathing, you know, even when we're in, the, we're in the studios together, starting with breathing together and then doing sort of a sensory, being aware of the five primary senses with eyes closed just and, and usually leading into a movement exploration. And that was usually followed by a free writing thing I, that people were always a little bit mm -hmm. confused when they came into my classes because they came for a movement class and we'd start with standing meditation followed by writing. Um, 
but yeah, that mm -hmm. yeah, and when we shifted to online, I always started with like breath, breathing, just getting everyone on the same breath. They're all aware of their same breathing and their places, their focus, and then their senses, mm -hmm. and then their then the free writing without judgment or censorship or editing. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. I I would say that uh, the the big thing that breath makes me think about uh, in this moment is um, is a pause. You know, I feel like the whole pandemic has been a kind of a pause um, in business as usual, and. Um, And that, you know, in terms of uh, artistic practice, a, a contemplative or a, 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 a reflection feels like necessary. You know, it's necessary to, um, you know, it's one of the it's one of the great lessons of an artistic practice is it's like there's a doing and making and a reflection. Um, on on the doing and making, you know, it's kind of kind of go in circles, and um, and everything's a little bit more deliberate right now, and and that opens up the possibility of breath. And this, um, I was looking for the link to the Quiet Gathering, which is this weekly practice that I've been hosting. Um, we 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 literally do something like a Quaker meeting for part of it, which is we just we're in this video format. And we don't talk. And so it is live, you know, we are in the presence of one another and there's something um, you can feel yourself breathe. You can, you know, we ask people to, we encourage people to leave their mics on and stuff. You can hear the breath and the, the, the life, the breath of people's individual environments and a kind of like low hum of cacophony. And, you know, it is, it is a pause that it feels really meaningful, really, important for artistic practice and also maybe out of the many, many difficult things about the pandemic, one of the gifts of, of this moment is this like kind of interruption and a possibility of breath. Right. I'm a mentor to a, artist in res to a group of artists and residents at Movement Research here in New York. And someone said that at the very beginning or near the beginning that all these arts organizations were trying to ramping up. They were having more uh, online classes and they were trying this and trying that and trying that. And someone said, why don't we just take a breath? <laughs> like, why don't we just pause? Like, and, cause all these organizations are really just trying to go, go, go. You know, we're not gonna lie down. We're not gonna stop. And someone said, I mean, it was a young artist said, maybe we just should pause, stop, listen. <laughs> That was something that um, Virginia Heffernan, who's a uh, columnist for the LA Times, just described it in a broader sense about this sort of like possibility in this moment, just the sort of the great pause um, for those who were healthy enough to do it, uh, to take stock. She meant it in the, poli she meant it about our politics, which uh, is not disconnected from art. Um, you know, the possibility that people would all this, a large number of people would all of a sudden perhaps discover that the value system we've been running with isn't working for everyone. Um, that's a fundamental insight uh, that's connected to what you're talking about. Um, Ishmael, I think, did you want to, did you want to um, show something or describe yeah, something? I, I want to say that uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, the choreographers B.B. Miller, Ralph Lemon, and myself did a showing at a show at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, and they were streaming it for three more days. They're doing it until the end of July, so until the 31st on Vimeo. Or if you could go to the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, and it's interesting. I hadn't seen it until we did a sort of a, a watch party for it, and. Um, it was interesting seeing the three of us were all within a year of each other's birthdays. Um, we're all African American, three African American choreographers of us or of a certain age in their sixties, doing a com pretty much completely open improvisation for an hour. 
I want to just um, do you have it up because we can actually share screen if you want to. Uh, I don't have it up now. We have it. Okay, that's fine. I'm just going to put it up in the comments here so people can be sure to check that out. So just by going to the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago's website, right? They should. You can it. find that. Right. Great. Can I stay? Uh, can I stay with that for a second? In this time, um, uh, Mishmael, you know, after we, we talked a little bit about what's going on with protests there in New York, but for three African American artists to be together in this particular moment feels like a lot of pressure, frankly. Actually, it was a lot uh, of. I don't fun. know if you felt that. <laughs> really, it was, it was in 2018. So it was the fall of 2018. Um, oh, we've okay. all been around. We've, we've all been around each other, and we're compatriots. But we had never actually. The three of us had never worked together. and never really made anything together. In the 1980s, BB and Ralph had done a, a very short duet together. But other than that, we had not really been in each other's work. So we came with like three very different sensibilities. Uh, we got we rehearsed like maybe because BB lives in Ohio now. She so just retired from Ohio State University. So she would come into New York, I think, maybe four or five times in the year leading up to it. Mm -hmm. We made some very basic decisions and um, went for it. And it was like really live and really political and really kind of vibrant. And yeah, I was really proud of it and really happy about it. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that. I think people should definitely check this out. David, I cut you uh, off a second ago. You were going to come in. Oh, well, I'm just sharing a link to what is called the Quiet Practice, because Scott, you and I had talked about um, uh, uh, the possibility of uh, occasional appearances on COVID calls. And if there's some kind of like way in which it's possible to offer artistic practice to people, you know, like that's kind of headlongs. You know, that's kind of near and dear to the history of Headlong is um, that art isn't just for artists to make, <laughs> but that it belongs right. in the culture, you know. Um, so I thought I would share this link to, um, it's, it's the score for The Quiet Gathering. Um, and uh, I really, if anybody wants to to read it and and adapt it for some version of their own community, and to try it out or to feel free to ask me questions about it. Um, uh, but yeah, I offer that as a, as a, a score that kind of mixes like a contemplation and like really low to the ground making and sharing out of what comes out of the contemplation mm -hmm. that you don't have to be trained for, you don't have to have expertise um, for. Um, and so I just wanted to share that as a, as um, in case there's anybody who's listening to this or watching and they're like, you know, I would take something and try that out with some people I knew. So this is the quiet gathering. And if you're watching it right now, you can just take a screenshot of this and, and go and check that out. And if you're listening and want to know more about it, you can just email me, uh, Scott Knowles at sgk23 at drexel.edu, or you can email David Brick, and I think David, you're at david at headlong dot com. <laughs> dot com. You can also do dot org. Yeah, <laughs> we've we've had the domain okay. so right, long. Right. We have both of them. <laughs> okay, good. So, and you can reach out to David in that way if you want to participate um, and find out more about that. So we're coming up on time. Now, I have to say, well, all of the COVID calls are, I learned and every single one of them, this is one I, I kind of wish we could just leave the camera on for a while uh, and watch you both be creative, but we don't want to, um, we don't, we want to give people a chance to um, get any final question they have in and, and then we'll, we'll draw this to a close. We've been listening to COVID calls uh, with David Brick and Ishmael Houston Jones. I, w I guess I'll just open and see if either of you have a question for each other or something else you wanted to say about this experience that um, we can build on. Mm. I don't know. I'll say that, um, you know, we, we touched on the, the idea of teaching 
um, you know, and, uh, you know, like kind of leaning into uh, an, an art world that's maybe a little less about who the experts are and like this, you know, what I would interpret as like the spectacularness of art and more about the practice of art as being like available to everybody. And I'll just say, um, you know, Ishmael is a teacher of mine and, uh, uh, and the way in which, you know, Ishmael's work as an artist, I do feel like is, is encompassed by who he is as a teacher, like the discourse of art and thinking as much as through Ishmael's amazing work has gone into the world. Like he's like a prolific teacher who like, you know, has uh, influenced so many people. And I think about that in this moment, you know, as a, as a touchstone, you know, just as a, as a touchstone for what art practice is, is the, the sharing of artistic ideas and possibilities for doing things. And um, I, I don't know if I'm saying it very well, but it's hard not to say it with Ishmael, like right here, you know, it's like the, I feel like he's the embodiment of somebody who's, whose ideas travel out, not just in the work of art, but in the exchange um, with people ar around the ideas of art, around the, the practice of art. And I, I, you know, I think we, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I, I want our world to embrace that idea of the, of, of art and the artist more, you know, that it's, it's, it's the exchange between people. It's the exchange of, um, of practice, you know, not just the, you know, the work of art itself. It's very well said, David. Um, it took me a long while to do that because I mean, our training, the way training happens, like it's about the product often, you know, you're trained to be a better dancer, a better technician, a better improviser, a better whatever, and you're going to make this thing to be shown to people. And it's taken me, you know, like six decades to realize that that, the sh that isn't what is important, but what is important is what you just said, it's the sharing. So it's whether I'm teaching, whether I'm performing, whether I'm curating. Curating was actually a really big thing we didn't touch on today is that, you know, putting together these two large platforms at Dance Space were really key for me and really important uh, writing, that all of those things are like of equal weight. And so it's not just about the product, which is sort of where, where and I was coming up when I was, you know, younger and starting, it's like, oh, yeah, you're gonna do this, and you're gonna do it, you're gonna make, 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 and that was it. And that isn't it. That is part of it. It's a part of it. But there's so much more. And the, the main thing that combine that connects all of those things is that um, it's about exchange, exchange of energy, exchange of idea, exchange of personhood with other people. And without that, there's you know no reason to create these products. That point um, is so well made and so well taken, and I think resonates also with the research community that's listening to this because. Um, People have been talking about waiting for this. You talked about the product, the artistic product and the pressure of that. And people are sort of waiting for this disaster to end too. They're sort of like, well, we're waiting for this moment of com the completion of this disaster, but I don't think it's not gonna work that way. And, and I think a lot of people who are in it, who are providing care, who are teaching, just getting through their daily lives are, are feeling this need to get through the day by day. We talked about different possibilities for new practices or art or conversation or just getting through the day and breathing. Um, that is just so important right now. And it's, I know that's frustrating. I, it's definitely frustrating to people who would like to get back to normal. But as Ishmael said at the beginning, I mean, this is also a profound moment to stop and think, what was that normal we're trying so hard to get back to? So I hadn't made that connection until you both just were talking about this, the pressure of the product and this final thing. I, I don't think we have that possibility right now. We're in this for a while, right? Yeah, and we have to like live and breathe and make, you know, with what is happening can't like wait, you know, I feel it very acutely. Like can't, I can't wait for it to end, you know, like we have to, 
I have to, I yeah. have to stumble, stumble, stumble around, you know, not be an expert, but just be trying. No, definitely. Here's your vaccine. Go make <laughs> art now. That's not going to work, right? <laughs> it's not going to, no. Well, um, this has been tremendous, and, and I learned from both of you in this in this hour we had together. I want to remind everybody you've been listening to COVID calls, and uh, my guests today, Ishmael Houston Jones and David Brick, talking about choreography and dance and creativity and much more in the midst of the pandemic. You can catch COVID calls live every weekday, at 5 p.m. And uh, David, um, well, both of you are welcome back anytime. And I think David, um, you're, uh, we're going to have you back soon. I hope maybe with, um, another choreographer or, or more people. I'm not sure we haven't totally figured it out yet, but this is not the last of this kind of discussion we're going to have. I hope. Great. I'm excited for more. Um, maybe Ishmael will want to come back again. There's so much to keep talking about, I think. Oh, cool. It's great. It's a great experience. Well, thank you both again. And everybody, stay healthy, and we will see you tomorrow at 5 o'clock.